welcome to Full Scottish Breakfast. My name is Ken McDonald. <laughs> My name is Ken McDonald, and our guests today are uh, Janet Fogel. Welcome, Janet. Uh, Janet's a Scottish actor who trained at the RSEMD with a long list of credits in Scottish theatre, film, and television. Welcome. Thank you. Also, we have Day Tucker, who, after a career of teaching, living the dream to become a farmer, who started in 2000. A very warm welcome to you too. So we have a, a fairly busy agenda today, uh, starting specifically on EU elections. Dave, what's your thought on the forthcoming EU elections? Are you happy with what's going to happen? Uh, I'm very confused um, about what will happen, not from my point of view, because I know exactly what I'm going to do and always have done, because I have been educated to understand the EU through being a rural leader. When we were taken to the EU and to Westminster and to Holyrood and we were taught about how political systems work and how one is different from the other and comparing the two. So I do understand how important the European elections are, particularly for us farmers. And how, how important would it be, given the fact that we're actually supposed to believe in the EU, what are you going to achieve with this new election? If it only lasts for three well, or four months, what can be achieved? I'm hoping that it will send a message. If everybody um, can garner an understanding about the EU and back us staying and remaining in the EU, that they will get out and vote, and vote for a party, I'm going to say the SNP, because that will send a really strong message to the EU that we should remain in Europe and it's time that they recognised us as a country as opposed to simply a region. Do you think this will be the most important EU elections ever? Absolutely. Yes. Well done. Jeanette, do you think that uh, people are getting donor, uh, donor fatigue? <laughs> Voting fatigue, do you think that's a possibility? I don't know, I kind of love voting. I used to always go with my mum when I was a wee girl, she used to take me and I used to think when I'm grown up I get to do that. And I do actually take it really seriously when I stand in the booth, I don't just kind of run in and dash off again. I think, I think this is complicated, this EU election, because I think a lot of people might go, well, what's the point if we're leaving anyway? But I do think it's very clear, important that in the EU referendum, Scotland voted so clearly to remain in the EU. And I think it's important that people make it clear that they haven't changed their mind about that. I think I have a son who's in his late 20s. I think for young people, being in the EU is hugely important. Just their sense of not just having a small identity, but having a big identity. Um, and I, so I think from that point of view, us older people maybe have a responsibility to think about that a bit. Well, what are we leaving? for those, those youngsters. Um, I think the farming thing is really important. I'm a food person. I'm a careful shopper in terms of reading labels and stuff. Um, I think just it's important also because I th the arguments that come up about the EU all the time. And one of the things, I mean, I made a wee note about this yesterday about co before coming on, is, is the thing about negotiation is how people seem to think, you know, you get people say, leave means leave. And you say, well, what is that then? Why is everybody so negative about the idea of negotiating a withdrawal agreement? If it's going to be that, then there has to be a negotiation about that. And then you see people like, you know, in question time going, no, 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 leave me. I just want out. And you go, well, if it was your marriage and you said, I just want out, and, some, and the partner that you've been married to for 40 years said, OK, then, there's a divorce. I've got my lawyer. You've got yours. They signed it. You then, and then you say, but what about the house? Well, you didn't ask about the house. Yeah. You just said you wanted a divorce. So as soon as you say you want something, like you want some money or whatever, then it's a negotiation. And I think to be clear about, on the one hand, about absolutely saying you want to stay in the EU or that it matters to you, is maybe a flag to people to say, you have to have a discussion. This is a very divided country. Yeah. So whatever yeah. happens, we have to have a proper discussion about who we will be afterwards. But the narrative has been controlled by obviously Westminster and yeah. it's fairly self-evident that the regions don't get much of a, a mm. chance to offer their vision mm. for what they're trying to do. Yeah. So the poor voter, I mean, who's already voted 62% to remain within the European mm. Union, 
why would anybody want to go out and vote again if they've already made their case clear? Why would they have to you know, redouble their efforts to... Do you think there will be probably a very low turnout, which could... I don't, again, I'm not quite sure what the, mm. the turnout is for EU elections. I think it is relatively low compared to, say, general elections. The referendum was a high turnout. Um, so one would hope that people who that would, would get out and would make their voice heard. Do you know, the, a lot of people have reluctance about going on marches or kind of protests and stuff. But this is maybe a way of saying, OK, I don't want to do that, but I, will, I do want to make it clear. Mm -hmm. I, I would be inclined to vote for a pro-EU. I think, I don't think anybody who voted in the EU referendum just walked into the booth and casually went, yeah, 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 you know, let's do it. I think a few probably did. But this closeness of the result, to me, indicates that a lot of people, like myself, stood in the booth actually thinking about all kinds of things, historical context, economics, all of that. And there's a point at which you get with, that this election maybe would be a bigger thing, because you can ignore marches, you can say that's just people getting out on the street and shouting. Yeah. But an election is an official thing. So maybe it would be a way of actually saying to all politicians, the Labour Party, Conservatives, Greens, SNP, all parties, actually, this is a point where you have to actually sit down. You have to lead the way yeah. and show what negotiations mean. I hope we stay in the EU. Realistically, I don't think we will. But I think we need to have some kind of proper conversation. I mean, like yes. for people like in farming and, and fishing, which has suddenly been thrown into the mix, like, like you know, nobody's, everybody's ignored it for years now, thrown into the mix going, actually, this has been a real situation for a long time. And we need to talk about where do you want your food to come from? What, how do you want it to be labelled? Mm -hmm. Do you, know? do, do you, do you um, see any movement within uh, farmers who may well have voted to Brexit? Since I, I see a small movement. Um, and it's still very, you know, movable. Um, I'd like to see a greater movement, but I don't think it'll come simply because our education system in the whole of the UK, never mind Scotland, does not teach our youngsters what the function of the EU or indeed our own parliaments are. Um, and until we can get that into the curriculum somehow without it being labelled as propaganda. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's not so long since I remember seeing somebody complaining about the EU um, communications, uh, of which there's a vast arena. You know, there is no excuse for people not to understand the EU if you're on social media, um, whether it's Euractive or, or any of the EU things that they now put up there to educate us and tell us what's happening and try and involve us, including consultations. Um, you know, until we can get past that, oh, that's just propaganda, yeah. then, you know. But I mean, it's interesting though, after the, the referendum, and I've got friends who live in Cornwall and in Derbyshire and all over, and after the referendum, you see people who voted to leave the EU, they say, but we'll still get our, our funding for our land mm -hmm. or our roads. Well, no, it's, it's a big no. sign at the side of the road that said it's an EU project. That's right. So you need to, what made you think that that would still happen? So aside, um, from, aside mm, from the fact that there mm, may well be voter apathy, there's also a certain amount of public ignorance. Mm, absolutely. So what mm. are you actually doing to try and combat that? I mean, do you get involved with the yeah. National Farmers Union to try mm, and... Oh, yes, we do, down? we do. Um, the National Farmers Union is very well aware and very well educated about it. Um, but I only understood it from 2007 onwards mm. after becoming a rural leader where I, I was actually told by one of our um, peers who sits in the House of Lords that um, we would be wasting our time talking to Westminster politicians because the power lies with Holyrood and with, the Europe, with Europe, with Brussels, and that these were the politicians that, that we would get most out of. And I have to say, I found that true. I work right across the, the spectrum of, of the political um, landscape. Uh, and, I, and my MPs, when, when it was, we, we had a lovely Labour MP, but she always simply followed the party line and it didn't matter what it was that we wanted her to address. And the uh, Secretary she of didn't. State for Scotland, what engagement did you have with him regarding certainly the exciting <sighs> funding, 160 million? And I, I, I don't know that I can 
talk about the Secretary of State for Scotland without getting very angry and upset. I think he has let Scotland down dramatically. I think he's let his 13 MPs down dramatically. He's even let the Tory party down dramatically. What, what was I don't see what his function is. Well, I'm saying he obviously have been discussing with his organisation regarding farming within Scotland because obviously he's the Secretary of State and it's his remit to look after the interests of Scotland. What has he said? What does he say when you... He just says no, basically, most of the time. Oh, really bad. Yeah. It's, it's appalling. Yeah. Um, and, and I happened to be watching when, was it the Scotland Bill was going through Parliament? And it was no. For every amendment, yeah. no, no, yeah. no. And that really upset me. And I thought, what is the point when your own Secretary of State, I mean, we've had some humdingers of Secretary well, so of State over the years. He's a rural community, doesn't he? Oh, his, his constituencies. Yeah. But how on earth was he voted in in the first place? Is it because we've got loads of people in the borders who see the advantages of living in Scotland, so they come up and they live in Scotland, but they're bringing with them all the baggage and I stuff? Think, I do think there is actually a political thing, an issue about that. Um, mm -hmm. with, with, um, and I would say it's up with all Conservative, Scottish Conservative MPs, and this is going slightly away from the EU, but... Um, you know, with this kind of English votes for English laws, so um, you don't get to vote on something in the first two par parts of its passage through Parliament, it's done in committee, then it comes to Parliament, everybody gets to vote. The SNP have always traditionally said, we won't vote on anything that doesn't mm. affect us. Mm. So when it came up with the bill about the school meals for, for children up to, I can't remember the exact details of it, but up to P4 or 5 or whatever, mm. um, all of the Scottish Conservative members of Parliament voted down the amendment that would keep those free school meals for those children in England and Wales, knowing it won't affect them in their constituencies mm -hmm. because the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish Government, protects children in Scotland, mm -hmm. that they will have those free school meals. So you kind of go, it's a kind of interesting thing there because they can do what they like at Westminster and yeah. it doesn't affect them in their own constituencies yes. because yes. their constituencies, so their children, they don't have mothers and fathers coming and knocking on the door going, my kids are hungry now. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how much of that kind of thing actually drives, even with the, the EU, the situation, and with David Mundell, yes. is that he can actually do what he likes through yes. Westminster yes. because it doesn't necessarily affect the poor farmers, the mm -hmm. farmers who are really struggling and who are looking to get benefits, to get more um, child support, whatever. Mm -hmm. It doesn't affect them in Scotland because they're protected yes. in, under so many of those kind of social policies. Yes. So but also there's a policy problem, to say, dare I say it. I look at him and I think he's, he just doesn't seem that bright to me. You no. know? I, I could... I think he's there by default. Yeah. You know, yeah, there's nobody, there was nobody there else. There was nobody else. So do you, do you have any opinion on the Sunday Mail coming out for support of the Scottish Greens, how that's going to, the reason why they would do that, or the effects of trying to promote the Greens for the European Union? To split election? the vote. Mm. I, I, I think that, you know, it, that can be their only reason, to suddenly switch to, yeah. to that. I can't, well, <laughs> Sunday Mail can go, yeah, I, I might go, go like, um, could somebody pass me a canister full of salt here, okay. you know, um, okay. I think, uh, I'm not sure as well of, um, how the readership is going with these newspapers now that they're going more and more online, if they, and there's a bigger online um, readership amongst SNP voters and Green voters than there is between, amongst the traditional parties. Do you think there's any, um, um, any way they're trying to capitalise on the fact that there is, I mean, I know we hear it fairly regularly, but that a lot of disillusioned SNP mm. um, followers and supporters, that maybe they're trying to take advantage of that small mm. fissure, shall we say, and, and their impatience about mm -hmm. pushing ahead yeah. with independence. <laughs> but also we see that um, there are new Brexit parties arising. Mm -hmm. Some started within several weeks, mm -hmm. and it's just a state of turmoil, a state of mm -hmm. flux. So how do you think the thing this is, is, is the thing about the the SAP and the Green Divide is there's also the issue, isn't there, that um, Nicola Sturgeon made a big statement about the climate crisis, um, and that this is something that we need to address. 
and she's been quite bold about that. And she's actually done that in the face of, um, you know, we've got like, um, I've just something I noticed the other day, but the, the US and the Arctic nations who have their big, their own kind of like community meetings and stuff, and they um, put through a, a resolution to take action to protect the Arctic. And um, the US said they weren't going to vote for it, they were going to veto it because it mentioned climate change. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So, somebody like Nicola Sturgeon standing up and going, this is actually a crisis. She's be, it's, it's pretty bold mm -hmm. um, for, you know, a, a wee girl in a, in a small nation. Mm -hmm. um, so, they might be able to do that. The Greens um, have always been climate change. Um, they've, they've always had a kind of clear policy about that. Yeah. And it's probably easier to go... To, to select that, but I agree with you about the thing about splitting the, splitting the vote. But voting but for yeah. a Green Party, given mm. that we are going to be leaving the European Union, mm. which, I mean, there's legislation regarding mm. environmental issues yeah. that would be locked out mm. from us thereafter. Mm. I mean, how does that compute? It doesn't make sense to me, really. Well, I, I, I think oh, then, it's, then you could say, cynically, a cynical calculation is you split the vote, um, the Green Party or the SNP loses MEPs, in which case we're leaving the European Union, so it doesn't matter, but we said the right thing, we look like we yeah. were on the right side of yeah. history, it's purely but actually not actually Tactical. caring. So is, is there a major um, climate change legislation that's going to be lost when we leave the European Union for farming aspects? Yes, I, I would say so, um, because I don't trust Michael Gove, who's playing a tactical game and making all the right noises, but we know how he can change his mind. We know how many of the Tories change their mind. Our own Ruth Davidson is well known for changing her mind. So I, I don't trust Michael Gove or the Tory government or indeed the Labour government because they will put um, a economics before and, and growth. But with the uh, fact that we are Brexiting uh, sometime this year. The legislation regarding farming and the exportation of foodstuffs, mm -hmm. the veterinary legislation, which mm -hmm. apparently is, is pan European, doesn't exist anymore. So, how does that impact upon farming of trying to sell food that doesn't qualify for the same European legislation? by the fact that we're not a member of the EU. Yeah. You mean it will not exist well, it, if we it, leave? It won't be, although we comply of that date, we certainly don't comply because we're not signed up to the EU. So yes. this is going to be quite devastating to farmers, one would have thought. Yes, it will, because Scotland's food production is of a very high standard, both animal health and welfare, and in fact, in fact with an environmental footprint that's extremely low if you compare it with the majority of countries. Um, in the EU, where the production is very intense, um, and and it just doesn't bear scrutiny against America, where it's incredibly intense. Yeah. So, can I ask you a question specifically about chicken? This chlorinated chicken, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe, or I might believe, or you can correct me, that the chlorination is specifically to destroy any contamination that may well be on the chicken, mm -hmm. because of the way the chickens have been harvested from it. That's but right. No, it's a good word. So that's, the, that's the, the only reason why they're doing it, and not for any other... Um, I understand that is the case, but already there is research out there that says that the chlorination process actually doesn't kill a lot of the bacteria that ends up on these chickens. So what, what's the difference between Scottish chickens farmers and the Well, we, we don't chlorinate them, and there's a higher animal health and welfare standard for the chickens that we... I mean... Let's face it, it's, you know, it's not the best, but um, it doesn't compare with small farms where the chickens are free range, but it, it's a high standard of animal health and welfare. Okay. It's also part of the whole EU thing, I think, but as I said, I'm, I'm a foodie, I'm a big label reader. And, um, and it's, if you end or take yourself out of um, a group, whatever that group might be, but you still need to be in a group in order to do your work. So, if I'm working as an actor, if I walk out of a theatre company, I don't get to be an actor unless I join another theatre company. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I might then join another theatre company and go, God, this is shit. <laughs> Whereas the one I was in before had great standards of women. So we're in that situation. Like if we leave the EU with all our food production rules and regulations and stuff, we still need to sell and market and we still need to import. Mm -hmm. Now, everything I've read recently coming out from the US, the kind of trade secretaries there, 
there's things that they're saying, and you're talking about a market of 60 million people versus a market of nearly 350 million yeah. in the US, is saying they will do a food agreement with us if we drop what they consider to be unnecessary unnecessarily strict rules. Mm -hmm. So Can that I doesn't just here for yeah. a second. Yeah. Unnecessary strict rules like the number of bugs <laughs> yes, that, that are were you just about yeah. to say that yeah. mm. on a mm. carcass or on within honey, within yeah. the food even after it's been packaged. Yeah. Yeah. But it's also things that kind of in maggots, how many maggots, maggots you can have yeah. what what percentage of um, rat Feces per, you know, however yeah. many thousand grams, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, isn't the, it the, the very nature of farming is going to be very, mm -hmm. very difficult given the supply chain mm -hmm. speediness of from field to mm -hmm. being butchered to uh, being on the shelf? How can you possibly decontaminate any animal that's going into an abattoir? Before that? How, do you, how can you validate that? How do you validate it? Well, certainly, I know that certainly in foodstuffs preparation, Food standards. You, would, you would have a label that would say yes. may contain traces of peanuts. Mm. Yes. Because yeah. you just can't, even though you clean it, it may well be. How can you get Yeah, but if you, but if you go from, if you're in a situation that says may contain traces of peanuts yeah. because this jam was made and jarred yeah. in a factory which is, you know, 12,000 square metres yeah. where they also made peanut butter at the end of the factory. Yeah. But it may con that's fine. Yeah. That is different to may contain traces of, of peanuts because we kind of wash the filters out before we yeah. put the jam through. Mm -hmm. And so you might actually get a whole peanut. So um, the the other this food production thing of... of, of um, the standards for animals. So I have friends in America who say th it's impossible to find out where the food came from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they might say, I don't want to eat um, chicken produced in China, yeah. or that they produce China chicken in America, they send it to China to be processed, and then it comes back. I want to buy chicken that's grown yeah. locally, organically in my own state. Mm -hmm. They can't find that out. Find and that. I think we've already gone that way with labelling in this country. Is mm -hmm. I can't go in my local co-op and find out if I can, like, I know that they sell mushrooms that are grown in Scotland, Ireland, um, Lincolnshire, wherever. Now, I can find ones from um, Ireland and I can find ones from Lincolnshire with the labelling, but everything else is um, products of the UK. So I'm going, but I want to buy mushrooms that were grown 50 miles <laughs> away, not 500 us, miles away. This brings us on to the next section. One was, uh, I was in Hungary and saw a factory that actually had uh, UK eggs. Mm. They hatched them and then sent them back to the UK which obviously from a carbon mm. footprint point of view isn't particularly uh, good. And we're coming on to climate change now, really. Mm. Is there a climate emergency? Airport duties, we have to have uh, airport duties to counteract the effects of carbon footprint, although I have no idea what happens to the money, I must say. Uh, and then the deposit return scheme, do you think we're actually just creating something to be seen to be doing something? Yes. Or do you think these actions actually have a positive uh, action on climate change? I think these small actions are worthy of doing, particularly the deposit one, the oh, bottle yeah. deposit thing. I mean, let's face it, when we were kids, yeah. that was our pocket money. You know, we could, you could find mm. bottles lying here, there and everywhere. And, I still and remember the beauty of a Tizer bottle with the big green glass. Yes, yes, yes. absolutely. And, and it's is, reusable. is this only for lemonade? Is this only for um, soft drinks or is this for bottles of wine? And I, I'm afraid I don't know. I think it's exactly. it's quite common. I don't know if it's about wine bottles because they don't necessarily have a screw top. They've got a cork top. But, uh -huh. but I seem to, I think it's, I, I read a thing about this last night and I didn't write, see, I take notes and I didn't take enough notes on it. Um, but I think it's quite comprehensive. There's quite a lot of plastic bottles, plastic glass bottles, bottles and cans. Yeah. And yeah. Cans Single, and use. Um, Single use. Single use. But... Yeah. <laughs> just, <laughs> Michael Gove, I did actually say, is he possibly the stupidest man alive? Um, he actually talked in Parliament in Westminster earlier this week about the bottle return scheme, saying, um, although he commends Rosanna Cunningham's efforts, etc., <laughs> um, he says the bottle return deposit scheme endorses separatism. Yeah, I can and you quite go, fair. <laughs> and it's vital that we make sure it works for the whole, it works UK wide. Which way you go? So, Clean up your own backyard. Yeah, don't you yeah we, we, um, we had a look. I'm just hearing you here about the, some of the information, but effectively the only um, segregation that I'm aware of is uh, clear glass to brown glass mm -hmm. uh, was the only um, yeah. separate way. And mm -hmm. certainly um, our Gale and Butte Council, from where we're from, Helens, mm -hmm. supplies us with a specific bin for glass mm -hmm. and for metal. So yeah. what effect do you think this... Um, I think this is about... Um, 
to reduce the amount of waste because what happens with like plastic bottles is people just throw them away throw them you know away. yeah but i mean to be honest with you <laughs> i'm really i would ban bottled water this is an utter nonsense in yeah. Scotland. But you've got the beautiful, beautiful my friends come up from England and, and they rush like for a glass, for a glass of tap water because they're going, oh, it's so delicious compared to like what you get in London or wherever. Well, there is, there is, and it's, there is a, mm. uh, sorry to cut across, mm. there is this kind of uh, feeling that even having a, a bottle of water, mm. a plastic bottle of water mm. in a car can have mm. bad effects because the plastic, if it's mm. hot enough, can yeah. disintegrate and you're actually ingesting water with yeah. micro mm -hmm. bits of Plastics, plastic, which is pretty bad. Um, I'm also, uh, I know that they have this this uh, scheme set up for cans and for bottles, but we also have retention mm. bins. For, mm. I know Stirling is, they've got a huge amount of, of bins from my, my son's house. Mm. So this is, is this not a duplication of efforts? Or is this just a, a no, big, because this is to stop the thing. I mean, you see all those films of course. like, where it's just like plastic bottles left on beaches. Um, they're in the ocean. They're in mm. rivers. When I used to live um, in the country, people would come down, they would park it down up some lane, you know, shove their, eat their McDonald's, etc, etc, etc. And then they would leave all their plastic bottles and stuff lying around. Mm -hmm. So I think this is about saying to people, encouraging people to think again, you use them, yeah. reuse them. If you buy a bottle of bottled water, it was one of those wee pop-up tops, mm -hmm. keep it and use it again. Use it again. Um, but I, also, see, I, I rely mm, on iron mm, brew plastic mm, bottles and stuff mm, to, for my lamb, pet lambs. Mm, really? They're yeah. the perfect mm, size for mm, pet mm, lambs. Mm. Um, <laughs> and I struggle to get them when I need them. Yeah, but, from yours. Uh, you know. So I, I know that generational uh, change happens. Mm. Uh, I've been slightly older than 21, and mm. I can remember um, seeing signs on the trams, uh -huh. uh, the latter days of the trams, mm. and the buses, no spitting. Mm -hmm. And I always wondered what that was all about. Mm -hmm. Now yeah. it was fairly common, obviously, with people who smoke. We had mm -hmm. smog and a lot yeah. of things, yeah. but mm -hmm. social mm -hmm. acceptance was reasonably mm -hmm. an end then. But now nobody would even contemplate the idea of yeah. it. Mm -hmm. It's probably yeah. only in football fields we see it. Mm -hmm. Do you think that uh, deposit schemes and that environmental uh, concerns will actually change with the next generation? Do you think that's going to be something that's just. I think it will. Talk and talk I about? think the, the throwaway generation that we've come mm -hmm. through. Um, well, cer certainly, it's, it's maybe taken up about a quarter of my life because I'm so old. But, um, <laughs> Me too. <it's, laughs> but the throwaway generation, I think, ha mm. is passing or has just about gone. And the, the exciting bit is recycling and what can we do with it. Yeah. Now, as a farmer, my sa wrap silage, you know, the black wrap that goes around the silage, that goes down to Dumfrieshire and this wonderful factory turns it into things like um, playground furniture, mm -hmm. fence posts, um, pig huts, calf mm -hmm. huts, you yeah. name it, they will do it. Yeah. And the really exciting thing is that I understand this, I don't know if they're linked, but right next door to them is another factory that collects plastic waste, I think like bottles, and it turns into stuff that you can make roads with, yes. like the yeah. Indian yeah. roads do. Mm -hmm. There is, a, there is a company in Sweden that I know of, having personal uh, dealings with them, that they were keen on the idea of finding a supplier of fabric that they can make, uh, tablecloths, etc. Yes. That would take in uh, polyethylene uh, poly bottles, uh -huh. shred them, uh, recompound them into material and then manufacture from them. I think that's a, a reasonable way to go. Yes. But I doubt very much indeed that plastic will ever be totally deleted from... No, but it's no. the best way to recycle is to reuse. Yes. yes. And um, there's also to do with, uh, there's a kind of a social thing about people want things to be perfect. Everything has to be lovely. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I mean, I have a go about about cars. Do you remember how cars used to just have a black bumper on them, a black kind of bar plastic? And if you've got a wee clip, you put some black boot polish on it. And, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then somebody had the fabulous idea, like, let's make it part of the bootwork. And every little bump becomes an insurance claim because mm -hmm. everything's got to look nice. Yeah, yeah. So... People go out and they buy matching towels and tea towels and washcloths for the kitchen. It's mm -hmm. all got to be yellow and it's all got to be this. Mm -hmm. When I was a kid, my dad's old vests that he couldn't wear anymore got cut up and used as, as cloths Cloth, for yeah. like cleaning floors and wiping. And then they would get mm -hmm. thrown in a hot wash. Mm -hmm. And and so stuff didn't end up in the bin until yeah. it was there was so little of it left that it barely showed up. So you you had a shopping bag that you took with you. Yeah. Um, you um, you know, and all old ladies, I count myself as one now, had shopping trolleys and people didn't have 
loads of bags and stuff, but then yeah. people didn't have massive out of town supermarkets. Some of, these, some of these supermarkets have plastic bags. I don't mean the wee white plastic bags, but the reusable plastic bags. Mm -hmm. They are manufactured in their millions. Mm -hmm. which is using a huge amount of, of, of mm -hmm. plastic to, to make it. I mean, that's just to exacerbate the, the, the situation of trying yeah. to minimise what we're doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember the, the chrome bumpers mm -hmm. before the black bumpers, <laughs> um, but I believe it was yeah. because the energy expended in manufacturing the chrome plate was mm -hmm. so high yeah. that they had to go onto plastic. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't know whether it will be a generational also, thing. Also, legislation, because people were getting killed when they got hit with those chrome bumpers. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, it was, they were so dangerous. It, uh, over even at 20 miles an hour, you yeah. were more likely yeah. to get killed if it was with a vehicle with a chrome bumper on. Because so I was thinking about the black bumpers, because I can remember no, my mum uh -huh. dad, they got a wee scuff on it, they yes. just put some polish on it. That's but now true. that wee scuff becomes a scrape yes. on a metal thing that then goes rusty, so it needs to be, mm -hmm. to be fixed. And, and so it's that kind of... Mm -hmm. mentality of like of everything needs to be perfect people yes. don't reuse mm -hmm. stuff so much so yeah. Yeah. you don't remember the days when nothing went to waste you mm -hmm. always reuse stuff you yes. always find yeah. the reason for it or um, Luckily enough, as a lad, I didn't get my, my brother's hands down because he was smaller than I was. But certainly, things would be reused. You'd never think about going out and buying something if you could make it yourself. Yeah. I mean, the thing as well is that you've got to be, we've also got to be careful not turning into kind of like, you know, kind of like when I was a girl, you know, it was all wonderful because it wasn't. Um, but I think it's part of that thing of, of just thinking about. Um, how you might use something again, or you, how you might donate something, uh -huh. either to a charity shop or yeah. sometimes you've got stuff and you kind of go in a local school and say, could the kids yeah. use this? And they go, oh, absolutely. Or yeah. schools building little greenhouses out of lemonade bottles yeah. so that they can then grow mm -hmm. tomatoes and stuff in and it's finding easy. ways of, of being creative. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's well, technological uh, solutions. I mean, I remember going way back uh, prior to having a big tape recorder and recording mm -hmm. the Sunday night tunes mm -hmm. on my week of set, and I remember the Beatles <laughs> asking for 50 pence. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, it was environmentally friendly, not yeah. producing all these plastic mm -hmm. records, but in other mm -hmm. hands, somebody was putting money. So it's mm -hmm. not really all about cash. Mm -hmm. that companies are trying to sell you products that are basically wrapped up in a, a, an exciting way uh -huh. to be able to buy it and to get you to buy it. So it's really realising why we're doing this, why we're creating so much. But do you know why I think it is? Because we're so obsessed with growth. Yeah. And, and if you have um, a non-throwaway society, you're not producing as much. And I'm sure that's what's behind it all. You know how we've, oh, we've got to grow so much every year and my country's got a higher GDP than, than yeah. your country, etc., etc. We need to get away from that. Yeah. Well, I that, think that's the place with food as well. Mm. I quite often go in and, and it's um, it'll say like you know um, you buy like <laughs> the two most careful things you're most careful of in the world about buying avocados and mangoes. <laughs> not like they joke about the avocado is not yet, not yet, not yet. Missed it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, but then they'll do a deal of like buy two or buy uh -huh. one get one free and buy one get one free with mangoes. You go well actually. I just want I just want the one uh -huh. to have today uh -huh. because they won't keep because I'm going to be out a lot or whatever. Uh -huh. But also it, it, it's then that kind of it encourages people to say, oh, I can have it because if I don't like it, I'll just throw the other one away mm -hmm. instead of going, why do you make that one half price mm -hmm. to encourage people? Say like even with like apples and stuff yeah. with kids mm -hmm. and just make that one a bit cheaper mm -hmm. to encourage people yeah. to buy it and to actually think about. I mean, the other thing that astonishes me is kind of climate as well, is how difficult it is in the shops to find a really nice English apple. Yes. Do you know, you say, I don't want a Cox's Orange Pippin from New Zealand. No. I want one from Kent. <laughs> Do you know? Or I mean, again, in this, uh, to include this section, it actually <laughs> says a lot when we have now food waste bins. Mm. Um, and we never used to have food waste bins, yeah. and mm. now we're, uh, I think it's a huge amount of tonnage. Uh -huh. um, so hopefully we can all be a bit better. Uh, well, I Scott, from the magazine point of view, if I can get my wee neb in here, uh, we've gone from uh, plastic bags to paper. Paper? Yeah, mm. paper, which probably means if it's raining when your postman's delivering it, <laughs> that'll be a soggy mess, but there you go, you've done the, saved a polar bear somewhere. Um, going on to a rather uh, sad, a article here, The Attack on Abortion Rights in America, where the HB 481, signed by Governor Brian Kemp, brought the law this Tuesday to take effect in 2020. 
And the bill is misleadingly termed a heartbeat bill that bans abortions at any stage of pregnancy after the detection of an embryonic or fetal cardiac activity. Any thoughts on? I'll let you go first. <laughs> Men and abortions. And fear doesn't mention yeah. whose was behind it. I mean, I just know that no. he was a leader guy, but I mean. Um, well, it was. Um, it's quite. I think it's the Republican House in Georgia. This is the most comprehensive um, abortion law I've ever come across. It first of all, it's. Um, it's, it's, it's like a, basically, you know, if a woman is probably six weeks pregnant, she can't have an abortion. And a lot of women wouldn't know they were pregnant at that time anyway. But there is a potential but that if she has a miscarriage, yeah. it could I be construed as a, a, a yeah. the other, the, the, There is sort of a lot of problems with this law. And it's it on somebody actually put something on, I think it was on Facebook about this thing. It is basically, in the end, it becomes a law that basically said the state, the particular state of Georgia, owns has ownership over the woman's body so if a jo woman in georgia discovers she's pregnant she's got a fetal heartbeat she doesn't want the pregnancy for whatever reason that's you know her business her body if she then leaves georgia and goes to another state where abortion is legal and has an abortion there when she comes back to georgia she can still be prosecuted and imprisoned on under um, the homicide law yeah. so she could end up 30 years in prison if she has a miscarriage, um, she can be interrogated, questioned, and if it's decided that she in some way contributed to the miscarriage, um, she can be charged with neglect and she could end up, I think, doing 10 years in prison. Now, the problem with that is, like, lots of women discover they're pregnant and they kind of go, mm. I don't know what I want to do about this, yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. Lots of women go out running, go to the gym, do yoga. And I think about this yesterday. So a woman discovers she's pregnant and she's maybe, she probably realistically be between maybe eight and ten weeks pregnant at that time. Doesn't know what she wants to do. I'm going to go out for a run. A lot of people go running to clear their heads um, or they go to the gym to clear their heads and listen to music and stuff. She goes out for a run and she's, and she's maybe, you know, um, pro-choice. And she starts to bleed. What does she do? Mm. At that point in her life, and she goes, actually, this is a moment where any woman who is pregnant, regardless of what they might want to do, any sensible friend, midwife, nurse would say, you need to get yourself to hospital, get yourself checked, make sure you're all right. Because miscarriage can have really serious consequences. Mm -hmm. um, but she does, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to seek help. Because I'm frightened of what the consequences of seeking help yeah. would be. And that's, that's devastating for women's health. Yeah. Um, th at any point in a pregnancy, if you have a miscarriage, um, you could be interrogated as a criminal. Yeah. It, um, does, it does actually say that abortions, it's not as if abortions are not happening in mm. the USA. Obviously mm. they do, but the uh, amount of self-induced, self-managed abortions are well on the rise in the United yeah, States. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, the whole... Well, there's also in... Um, I think, I'm not sure if it's, I think it's Ohio where they're um, changing the abortion law, but they're seeking to um, prohibit health insurance companies from offering um, ab abortion as one of the things, the, the healthcare things that they provide. So I mean prophylactics, so, is, is this, I really don't know whether they are made available on the equivalent of the NHS um, charities in the States. Well, but Planned Parenthood used to do that, but I think the funding for Planned Parenthood has been, been cut, cut back so dramatically. That, and so, as ever, this will impact most dramatically in the United States on poor women and black women who already have mm -hmm. the biggest um, problem in terms of like health care and um, perinatal health care during pregnancy, after pregnancy, around pregnancy, menstruation and all of that. Um, it's a devastating, for me, I just find it devastating um, that um, this thing about, you know, if a woman goes out of stage, comes back, basically the state saying, we own your body wherever you take it and we can we can make a judgment about what you do about it. Um, and it's also just recently, I was just reading a thing yesterday, in Florida, the House Speaker, they were talking about, he was discussing um, the issue between the mother, the health of the mother and the health of the fetus. And... Um, he five times he never once talked about the woman 
or the mother. Five times they talked about the host body. The host. The host. We have the difference between the host body and the the fetal body. And you and at that point you sort of go and um, you know when Margaret Atwood wrote Handmaid's Tale, she said, yeah. "I'm not paying in this book that hasn't or isn't happening or hasn't right. happened." And you, it, I, it, it's just. I don't even. I'm just I've beyond heard, angry about it. I've in never terms heard of, of this. To my shame, mm. the, the, you know, this is the first. Very recent. Just the last week that this is all. That this is all come it, up. It's medieval. Yeah, but also to kind of bring something in about this sort of this thing about how this affects um, which women this particularly affects. It will particularly impact all of these states, Georgia, Alabama, and Ohio, will particularly impact on poor women, mm -hmm. and it will particularly impact on black women. Where in the United States, black women are five times more likely to die in childbirth than white women. And those figures have now been verified in this country as well, um, through studies that have been done in this country. So these kinds of laws, um, they don't just have an impact on women as a sex class with, with human rights. They impact very specifically on certain groups of women who are the women who are the most vulnerable and actually probably most likely yeah. to become um, pregnant when they didn't want to because they'd be less likely to be able to access um, free um, contraception and health care and yeah, that I sort of thing. I was going to say that it's probably, I wouldn't suggest it was down to ignorance, mm -hmm. uh, it's more down to poverty, not having the ability to afford mm -hmm. uh, yeah. the ability mm -hmm. to, to not mm -hmm. have children. Mm -hmm. and America I, is a classic example of where there is no real national health service as mm -hmm. such. I mean, $2,000 a month is what the average person pays for basic medical care mm -hmm. and they still have a $150, $200 uh, upfront costs. Mm -hmm. And yet the, the American health service is what, or the health system, is what Nigel Farage is promoting. It's, also, it's the most expensive health mm -hmm. system in yeah. the world, isn't it? So there seems to be a common thread mm -hmm. running through some of the topics that were said today regarding you know, the packaging and, and everything else. It's all about money mm -hmm. and farming, certainly. Mm -hmm. uh, legislation is... is uh, I was also reading an article this yesterday or the day before about um, about how these kind of laws are an absolute attack on women's human rights mm. and and it, connecting it with to the movement with the kind of the rise of the extreme right wing across the world Bolsonaro in Brazil Trump and um, the things that um, Jess Phillips Carol Benjamin said about Jess Phillips the Labour MP and about kind of haha as a joke I wouldn't even rape her yeah. well I might if I was made to and yeah. um, Joanna Cherry who raised the issues in the Human Rights Committee in Parliament um, about with Twitter about the things that they will that, that Twitter will allow which are misogynist and threatening um, and violent um, the Italian, I can't remember his name, minister who made jo an Italian judge who said it wasn't reasonable that a woman was raped because she was too ugly to rape. Trump has said things like that. So there's a whole, like around the world, yeah. rise of an attitude of of, um, of attacking women and women's rights yeah. and women's um, freedom not to be abused and not to be assaulted. Yeah. Um, and as soon as a Joanna Cherry said, I was looking at something this morning before I came out, mm -hmm. since she did, and I watched the, the committee thing on television, and it was so reasonable. She, I mean, I have to say, I think Joanna Cherry, if I was in trouble, I'd say, Joanna, can you help me, you know? And if I was facing her, I'd be going, dreading the next question. But, mm -hmm. but she was so calm and mm -hmm. so reasonable and so persistent in this committee, mm -hmm. asking these questions about this kind of abusive language on Twitter and Facebook mm -hmm. and stuff. And since then has been subjected Delved. to a barrage of really, really violent threats, which has of a police escort to go home. Yeah. Jess Phillips, you know, who I think is a, I don't know if I vote, vote for her or not, but I do think she's mm. fabulous. I watch her in Parliament, I think, God, yeah, you're, she's black males, she's really funny. Yeah. Yeah. Um, ended up like crying on the, in the street because she's, because of um, these, these messages. And it's a thing that, it's a bit like the kind of, and we're slightly different to the Danny Baker situation, but it's a thing that men do not understand how that impacts you on you. And I'm a pretty kind of resilient yeah. woman, but there have been times in, when things have happened, and I've just kind of gone, oh, I'm just shutting the door tonight, I'm not going yeah, to. Yeah, so, social media in itself it's can be uh, uh, for good and for bad, but mm. uh, go back just to the second here for the, yeah. um, the attack on abortion rights. Do you think, mm. uh, Dee, that there would be a black market in uh, medication? 
Mm. In America, certainly, given the fact that mm -hmm. you have to buy, there is medication you obviously mm. take. Do you think there would be a, a black market that would start it up? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think so, yeah. And certainly from farming point of view, that you should have asked you earlier on, do you think there will be a black market in any uh, medications for our farm animals because of the EU uh, legislation? Well, there, there already is that, that seems to slip through Ireland. And mm -hmm. can you imagine what's going to happen if there's no border? Interesting. OK, next a happy one we've got here is the 20th anniversary of the Scottish Parliament. Yay. Good, mm. bad, indifferent. What's the best it's done yeah. for farming? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I cast my mind back to when it first started. And I have to admit, I thought, they're just like local councillors. Mm -hmm. Their rhetoric wasn't very polished. And they just, they didn't inspire me at all. Of course, they were called an executive then, if you remember. I do remember yes. that, yes, yes. Um, they certainly didn't inspire me. And, and I felt slightly ashamed and there was a bit of a Scottish cringe there from me at that time. Yeah. But I have to say, when I look now at our politicians, it's a different breed altogether. And yeah. they are very polished on the whole, right across the parties. Mm. Um, so it, it takes time, you know, it's just a, a very new parliament. And I think it's all the devolution of more powers. Oh, yes. And people actually under, are, I, I, I take answer your previous point about education, what can mm -hmm. happen here. Um, but people um, realising that, that what happens there, and actually being able to um, discuss and debate issues like why should Holyrood use all of its money to mitigate what Westminster does? Yes. And that sort of thing. I mean, I have to say, when, when the first vote in. in for the Scottish Parliament, I sort of wanted to, did actually discuss with a lot of like women friends going, can we all put blue plaques on our houses saying, we are the generation of women who, who were first ever in history to have a say about the Scottish Parliament. Because we were. Because Prior, we were. In 1707, yeah. it was only I'd men who did say that. And I remember actually going to vote kind of with a real kind of like going, yeah, yes, this uh -huh. is somehow, we are the first women ever to vote uh -huh. and have a say in yeah. a Scottish Parliament having yeah. governance yeah. over Scotland. Yes. A, bit, a bit like you as well, kind of going, yeah. you're going to be good at it. Yes, now, yes. please. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then the, the, the um, recent article of uh, the SNP government demanding permission from Westminster mm. yes. for mm. uh, Section 30. How do you think that kind mm. of... That great... Uh, I can unusual. sort of see why they're doing it. Mm -hmm because they want to be seen to do things correctly and legally. Mm -hmm. But how did we get to the stage where legally Westminster could say they could have that power to say yes or no? Well, if you recall, Maggie Thatcher had said if Scotland wanted independence, all it had to do was send the majority of SNP MPs yeah. to Westminster, and that's yeah. already been done. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. I, and yet... So wh where did this change come about that we had to ask I'm not permission. sure it wasn't at the last, um, did they, in order to have the last referendum, they had to put legislation through at Westminster to allow there to, there to be a, a referendum. Mm. But then you kind of go, it's one of those things you go, you create a law, yes. whether you, and you maybe you didn't need you that law, it, yeah. but now you've created that law, yeah. it exists. And so now you have to use it. But I think Brexit, mm throws the whole thing up in the air yeah. because yeah. suddenly you have to talk about like well what is the UK mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because you know you have um, that woman on question time saying give Northern Ireland back to Ireland mm -hmm. um, and let Scotland go I don't care mm -hmm. I just want out you yeah. say well who who are you then yes. so the are you so you're talking just about England yes. okay as a Scottish pro-independence pro-remain voter I would say England you can You've have your Brexit, yeah. take it, mm -hmm. yeah. and we'll have all the rest. So, mm -hmm. the whole that this whole issue seems to me to throw up the whole. And it's a friend of mine, Peter Arnott, writes about this a lot about mm -hmm. um, about actually what is Britain, what is the UK yeah. now? The whole thing now is yeah. kind of um, it isn't a is under consideration because so the, the, sorry, the, the yeah. section thirty isn't a legal requirement mm -hmm. uh, to have it. And the last referendum was two thousand and fourteen. So mm -hmm. in five years' time, what's actually happened? to progress Scotland, aside from the fact that the vote was no at the mm. time, a shallow no, to now when we are probably, votes are polling 
in favour of independence, mm -hmm. and certainly polling definitely in favour of staying within the, the EU. Yes. Do you think that um, the Scottish Government should just go ahead and say that the next election we have in Scotland is going to be a definition of whether we go, if we have a majority of SNP MSPs, mm -hmm. then we're just declaring independence? Do you think that would work, or do you think...? Yes, I think it would. I think it would. I think we're at the stage now where there will be a vote for independence, a majority vote, and a good majority vote, given the mess that's gone on down there and the treatment that we get. And why do you think that the SNP at the minute in time don't seem to be pushing ahead with independence, kind of kicking a can down the road from...? I, I think it's because a lot of them are lawyers and they want to do it the right way, the right way yeah. as they perceive. But so are you talking about going ahead with independence without a referendum at all? Just kind of going, OK, no. at the next general election, if we have return, say, I don't know, yeah. a, a, a clear SNP majority to Holyrood, then that, that government could say we're now going to go for independence, That's we're going to separate unilaterally. Generally, yeah. if it's in the manifesto, mm -hmm. and because of the fact that it was in the manifesto um, that they were going to have a second referendum, mm -hmm. the Westminster Parliament has overruled that, saying you will get a referendum mm -hmm. when we decide. Mm -hmm. And given the fact that the European Union vote was overwhelmingly to remain, mm -hmm. we're overruled. Mm -hmm. we, yeah. have to, we have to leave. And in the 1979 uh, referendum, which yeah. they call that one, mm -hmm. whereby the majority had... Um, 62%, I think it was 62% for the 1979, there was a 40% rule which meant yeah. that yeah. we lost. So in three successive referendums, we're having particular issues regarding democracy within Scotland that England always has a veto card, mm -hmm. or, or Westminster always has a veto card. They're numerically superior in what we're trying to do. So if the Scottish Parliament, or within, or sorry, Nicola Sturgeon's um, government had said, you know what, if we have a vote in Scotland, and we return a majority of MS MSPs, which is quite mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. probable. Why not just say to Westminster, we're off? Mm -hmm. I think there's possibly what you said about the legal thing, but I think there's also a kind of um, psychological thing, which has been made really clear, I think, again with the Brexit thing, that if you don't properly prepare for a result and a consequence, mm -hmm. you end up with chaos, mm -hmm. yeah, well, we'll where nothing else gets done, which is what's happening Britain-wide yeah, at the yeah. moment. And I suspect as well that um, if you don't have some kind of agreement beforehand between the two parliaments, then you, what you leave open is a, a huge dissatisfied part of the population still going, we didn't get a say in this, Remember so we're, we're not, we're kind of... We have the claim of mm. right, which mm. declared that England doesn't really have a say if the majority of people within Scotland want mm. independence, mm. then surely the Parliament of Scotland, which represents... Yeah, but, uh, but then if you're saying all parties have complicated manifestos at election with lots of different things in it. Now, if the SNP... Um, well, what they could do is they could face Ruth Davidson down, they could look her straight in the eye and say, OK, you want to make this whole election about independence, let's do that. Mm -hmm. Did you remember Janet? And we're not going to talk about anything else, we're not going to talk yeah. about farming yeah. or fishing or economy, except mm -hmm. where it impact is impacted by independence. We'll yeah. do that and see how it goes. Then I think that would work. But if you have a varied manifesto with lots of different things in it, mm -hmm. then realistically, you can absolutely define and say that people only voted in that one because lots of people vote SNP who don't vote independence. Yeah, but they had the um, claim of right was actually accepted by Westminster mm -hmm. Parliament. Mm -hmm. So there is no reason why they can't go ahead mm -hmm. and if they have in their manifesto um, a referendum. But now they're actually applying for permission. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I know, yeah. That's, com that's probably too complicated for me. But <laughs> I, d I just think actually if you there has you have you have to tread a path where somehow whatever the outcome when the out, if the outcome is positive and it's a yes that you can actually take people with you because right. we've seen i mean that would be the best possible argument would be mm -hmm. say okay well let's just look at what happens when you don't take people yeah. with you yeah, when well, you don't recognize so yeah. and what if you had a yes vote 
to leave the UK that was 51-49. Yeah. There's a point which, at the, and I felt this even at the last referendum, was our problem in Britain is most people in Britain don't like other people in Britain. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And there's kind of this the class thing, there's all of that. And um, so, th so there would have been a point then if you... If it had been 51-49 yeah. at the last referendum, where maybe you would have had to go back and say, OK, we'll do Devo Max. Now, if they put Devo Max on the referendum paper, it would have been a 75% yeah, winner. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, well, so it's a way to how... Yeah. And I feel this about Brexit. It's how do you go back and say to everybody, you are not going to get every single thing you want. You're just not. Mm -hmm. So we need to find a way where we can do something. Is What can you live with? Like the Northern Ireland, the yeah. Good Friday Agreement. What can you live with and what can you live with mm -hmm. that we can stop this um, chaos? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the, apart from the fact that the previous referendums that we have had, mm -hmm. um, we were won, mm -hmm. we've lost, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. We're yeah. suddenly realising that we're going to be vetoed mm -hmm. or outvoted. Uh, all the time, so certainly it's going to be an interesting, uh, an interesting year to find out what happens uh, regarding the um, possible parliament elections, yeah. depending what happens with Theresa May, etc. But let's wind up the last couple of minutes by talking about marches, the marching season. We obviously had a fairly successful event in Edinburgh last year with 150. Uh, thousand marchers and 100,000 in Glasgow, and we note that Cardiff held their very own uh, March for Independence on Saturday, albeit a crowd of, I think, about 3,000 turned up, the first time ever, quite a success for Cardiff. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's something in the air mm -hmm. that OK is going to fragment up? Yeah, yeah. yeah. definitely. There, well, I mean, and, and it's all been driven by the ineptitude of the Westminster government. Mm. Do you think people actually um, don't get politically engaged unless something actually happens to them, then they're aware? I mean, I recall the magazine was started because my wife had told me that I was obsessive about politics 24 7, 365. Mm -hmm. And she said that there are a huge amount of people that have lives to live. <laughs> they have children, mm -hmm. they have careers, they have jobs, and they can't sit down and understand what's happening in the day to day politics. But they all have a vote. Uh, until uh, it affects them. Until it affects them. Mm -hmm. And with the, the austerity um, agenda that the government of the day in Westminster mm -hmm. has, do you think that's probably pushing people more Definitely. towards politics? Definitely. Mm -hmm. And the treatment that the devolved regions, regions have had uh -huh. by the Westminster yeah. politicians. You, you've only to watch. And that's another thing. BBC Parliament now has massive viewing figures. Mm -hmm. So they can't hide yeah. anymore. Yeah. Yeah. All their behaviour is evident. And since the march in London, uh, when Tony Blair was Prime Minister regarding the war in Iraq, yeah. they had one and a half uh, million people turn up on the day, but mm. nothing changed. So do you think marches actually have any effect on...? I think probably a p large part of that is that people... Um, is our problem. Since 1979, and the election of Margaret Thatcher, the first-past-the-post system majority government has basically meant you get what you, you know, you worked in a shop and you bought a Mars bar, that's what you're getting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and there's very little that limits that in Parliament. Once a government has got a big majority in Parliament, there's very little that can actually limit what, what goes through. Mm -hmm. Amusingly, at the moment, the House of Lords, the unelected House of Lords, is more, has more control than, than anybody else. And I think now people with the Welsh Assembly, the Scottish Parliament, mm -hmm. are actually kind of going... We have actually experienced doing this differently. And yes. although they don't get up and rage and shout so much, actually watching the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish committees and how discursive it is, yes. and that they're not facing each other across a bear pit. And I think maybe there's more people are kind of going, we can do this better. We've got mm -hmm. 15 seconds to go. <laughs> so on that note, would you like to use one word for Scottish Parliament over the 20 years? Good, bad, or different? Good. 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 Well, thank you very much indeed to our guests today and to Jeanette. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. We'll be here next Sunday at the same time. Please tell your friends to come and watch us. And if you have a chance, please subscribe to iScope magazine. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much indeed for watching and tuning in. Thanks. Bye-bye now. This is where I